Yeah, so like Rosa said, I'm Tom Marsik. I wear multiple hats, but today I'm mainly representing the Cold Climate Housing Research Center, who is organizing this class. So I want to say thank you so much to the organizers and, and uh, to the sponsors. And of course, thank you to you all, uh, the participants, for the opportunity to speak with you about heat pumps for homeowners. So just a brief, a brief outline of what I'm hoping to cover. So um, we will talk about some basics and explain what a heat pump is. Uh, then we'll look at a comparison between different types of heat pumps. Then we'll look specifically at air source heat pumps and afterwards uh, look at how they have been performing in cold climates. Uh, then I'm gonna give you some, some heat pump resources Afterwards, I'm going to demonstrate what kind of savings are possible with a system approach when we combine a heat pump with other energy efficiency measures. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about financing and incentives. Uh, then I'll try to summarize the main conclusions. And at the end, uh, I want to demonstrate two online tools that will help you make your own decisions um, uh, and evaluate whether whether heat pump is right for you. So we'll get to playing uh, with those tools. Uh, when you have questions, uh, you know, feel free to ask right away, especially the things um, uh, where that we are covering. If your question directly relates to this, uh, to what we have on the slide, feel free to jump in. If you have a you know, more general question, um, um, you might want to wait till, till the end then uh, so we can manage the time a, a little bit better. Uh, so let's get started with that. So what is a heat pump? Uh, heat pump is a device that takes heat from a cold place and puts it into a warm place. So that's the opposite than what is happening naturally. So naturally heat from heat flows from hot to cold, but we can reverse it using a heat pump and we can make the heat go uh, from cold to hot. And, and you all likely have experience with heat pumps because you'll have probably used a refrigerator at some point in your life. And a refrigerator is a heat pump. So it takes heat from a cold place from the inside of the fridge and puts it into a warm place. That's why the coil on the back of the fridge is hot because that's where the heat is going. Or think of a freezer, you know, so a freezer is a heat pump. Inside in the freezer, you have say zero degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, so the freezer is taking the heat from the inside of the freezer and puts it, putting it to, uh, to the outside. So the, that's why the coil on the back of the freezer is hot. And so we can use the same technology to heat buildings, except now, instead of taking the heat from the inside of the freezer, we are taking the heat from the outside environment, which in a way in Alaska is similar to the environment in the freezer. So, so that's what a heat pump is. Now, if any of you is interested in more details about how it works, here's a here's a drawing. Uh, the heat pump uses a special fluid that we call the refrigerant. And, uh, and if you're interested in that specific cycle, you know, if I start here, uh, the refrigerant is in the form of gas and it goes through a compressor. Uh, that's why the heat pump uses electricity. That's mainly for the compressor. And the compressor compresses that gas. And you know what happens with gas when you compress it gets hot. And so then we send that hot gas into the building and there the heat from that hot gas, you know, that hot refrigerant is transferred into the building, which means in that process, we are cooling the refrigerant. And as we are cooling the refrigerant, it condenses into a liquid and we send the liquid out to the outdoor unit of the heat pump. And with the outdoor unit of the heat pump, it goes to what we call an evaporator. And in that evaporator, that liquid evaporates and through evaporative cooling, it decreases its temperature below the outside environment. So now the heat from the outside environment is transferred into that refrigerant. Um, and then that refrigerant are now in the form of gas for the compressor again, and, and the cycle continues. So uh, that's, how, that's how a heat pump works. Now the outside environment can be either the ground, then we call it a ground source heat pump, or it can be a body of water, then we call that water source heat pump, or it can be the outside air, and then we call it an air source heat pump. And that's what we are mainly going to focus on in this presentation. So that's uh, where the most interest has been. It has been in the air source heat pumps, in Alaska at least. So 
what are the what are the advantages of heat pumps? Uh, they are relatively low maintenance. They have no combustion on site. They are partially renewable because because the heat is in the outside environment and in the outside air. If we talk about air service pumps specifically, thanks to things like the sun, uh, they can be fully renewable if the electricity for the heat pump also comes from renewable sources. And uh, they have the potential to lower energy use and lower energy cost. And that's because their efficiencies are greater than 100%. And that's why we don't really call it efficiency. We call it the coefficient of performance because it is greater than 100%. Now, how is it possible that the efficiency can be greater than 100%? It's because of laws of physics that tell us that uh, energy cannot be created or destroyed. So the energy that we put into the heat pump in the form of electricity ends up in the building in the form of heat. And the energy that's extracted from the outside environment also ends up in the building. So, so now the amount of energy that we get into the building is greater than the amount of electrical energy that we have to put into, into the heat pump. Now, how many times greater? That's what the coefficient of performance tells us. So if that coefficient of performance is, for example, three, that means for every unit of energy we put into the heat pump in the form of electricity, we get three units of energy in the form of heat into the building. That's because that one unit that we put into it, it ends up in the building. And then the two additional units, it's what is what comes from the outside environment and it ends up in the building also. So now, again, for every unit of energy we put into the building in the form of electricity, we get three units of energy uh, in the form of heat into the building if the coefficient of performance is three, just, just as an example. So the Alaska Center for Energy and Power did a great job summarizing data from existing installations in Alaska. And one of the things that they looked at is the installed cost. So on the y-axis here, that's the installed cost per one unit of thermal output. It makes sense to show it per one unit of thermal output because obviously the bigger the system, the more it's gonna cost. And on the x-axis is the size uh, of, of the system. Uh, and when you, when you look at the data for the various systems, uh, the data points are all over the place. So it seems like we cannot draw any, any conclusion from this. And it's because the install cost doesn't just depend on the type of a system, it depends on other important factors. Things like how do we bring the source to the heat pump or how do we distribute then the heat throughout the building. But one conclusion that we can make from this and that actually relates to this, what looks like one dot in the lower left corner, but I'm not telling you, it's actually four dots on top of each other. And, and all those dots, uh, all, all those dots represent a ductless municipal heat pump. And so as you can see, it's you know, it's the lowest, the lowest cost type that we have among all this. And uh, part of the reason it's the lowest cost is there is no cost to bring the source to the heat pump. It's a, it's a, uh, it's an air source heat pump, just sitting in the outside air and taking the heat from it. And there is no cost to distribute the heat because it's a ductless heat pump. So uh, it's, a, it's a unit that just, uh, just for example, hanging on your wall and, and supplying the heat straight from that unit. So because of this very low install cost compared to the other types of heat pumps, uh, the ductless municipal heat pumps uh, have been getting a lot of attention. So um, and there's a lot of interest in these heat pumps. And that's why we are mainly gonna focus on these ductless municipal heat pumps in this class. So the Alaska Center for Energy and Power also looked at the COP, that coefficient of uh, performance. And so here it's plotted on the y-axis is the coefficient of performance. On the x-axis is the temperature of the source. You know, if it's an air source heat pump, that's the temperature of the outside air. If it's, for example, a water source heat pump, that will be the temperature of the water. And again, so they plotted the uh, coefficient of performance of different types of heat pumps. And when you look at the, the data points, they are again all over the place. 
it kind of seems like we cannot draw any any firm conclusion from this. But but there are some observations we can we can make. Uh, one relates to this blue square, which is you know the highest COP we have on this graph, and uh, this blue square represents a ductless mini split heat pump in Wrangell, Alaska. Uh, with a COP of uh, about four and a half, which is which is pretty impressive, but we can't you know just say based on that this, this that uh, ductless mini split heat pumps are the most efficient type because when you look at the lowest performing heat pump, so there's this green um, green circle um, with a COP of about one point six. It's also a ductless mini split heat pump. Uh, this one was in Dillingham, Alaska. So um, when you look at it, you know this one was at a much colder place, uh, you know much colder outside temperature. Uh, the one in Dillingham compared to the one in in Wrangell, Alaska. So so we can't really you know make any any solid conclusion about the type of heat pump. But but one conclusion we can make is that uh, we can say that the ductless mini split heat pumps can operate in a very efficient way if we use them in an appropriate situation. And if we use them in an appropriate way, just like was demonstrated here in Wrangell, Alaska. So now, of course, the question is: So, what are the appropriate situations uh, for an uh, ductless mini split heat pump, and uh, and how do we use them in an, in an appropriate way? So that that's something we'll try to get to uh, during this class. So, of course, there is a fundamental challenge when it comes to air source heat pumps. And it is that the colder it is outside, the more difficult it is for the heat pump to extract the heat from that outside air. And, and so the heat output of the heat pump is dropping as it's getting colder outside. Now, your building envelope is doing the opposite. So your building envelope, you know, as it gets colder outside, uh, the, the demand, the heat demand is, is increasing. So you end up with a heat deficit. And at some point, you know, if it gets really cold outside, uh, the heat pump stops working altogether. So at a point when you need the heat source the most, it stops working on you. So that means that we need a backup heat source in very uh, cold climates. That's simply going to take over when the air source heat pump cannot keep up or when it uh, turns off completely. And then another consideration is what is the source of electricity and its efficiency? If uh, we are talking about Southeast Alaska, uh, you know, with a lot of electricity coming from hydroelectric power plants, it makes a perfect sense to use to use heat pumps. Now, if we talk about places like you know, rural Alaska, where diesel is used for uh, electricity generation, and diesel is also used for heating buildings, then, then a fair question to ask is, well, does it really make sense to be you know, burning diesel in the power plant to supply the electricity for the heat pump when you can just burn the diesel directly on site uh, to heat the building? And when you look at the numbers, uh, an, an efficient diesel generator is, say, 35% efficient. Uh, an efficient uh, all forward heating system is say 85% efficient. 85% divided by 35% is about two and a half. So it means we need the coefficient of performance of at least two and a half for this to make sense. If the heat pump is operating with a COP that's less than two and a half, then the amount of diesel we are burning in the power plant to produce the electricity for the heat pump is greater than if we were just using directly the diesel on site uh, for heating the building. So another consideration here, are you going to use air to air heat pump or an air to water heat pump? And, and the reality is uh, that uh, the most interest has been in the air to air heat pumps. Uh, for the air to air heat pumps, I use a ducted or a ductless heat pump. And again, the most interest has been in the air to air ductless heat pumps because of the relatively low install cost compared to the other systems. Now, with the ductless heat pump, uh, are you going to use an external thermostat or are you going to use a built in thermostat? So, the heat pump here is a picture of what the, what the ductless mini split heat pump looks like. So, here is the here is the outside unit sitting outside in the outside air and sucking the heat from the outside air. And, and the indoor unit can have you know various shapes, but um, the most common one is this wall-mounted unit. And, and so that's the unit that's supplying the heat into, into your building. And it's simply sucking the room temperature air on top 
heating it up and and then and then blowing the warm air here into the room and here on the inlet uh, it has its own temperature sensor so uh, when you are using the built-in thermostat it's just relying on the temperatures temperature uh, of the sensor on the inlet of the unit uh, another option is to buy an extra external thermostat and and connect it and then you can have it wherever you want in in the house uh, with the with the built-in thermostat uh what's happening a little bit is that as the as the heat pump is blowing the warm air into the room uh because warm air rises a, a small portion of that air makes it back here to the inlet so the temperature on the inlet does not exactly represent the temperature in the room but it's, it's close enough uh, that most home, home, homeowners actually choose to just go with the built-in thermostat because that's the lowest lowest cost option. That way they don't have to purchase the external thermostat. And then, of course, the outside air cutoff temperature is an important factor if we want to use the, the heat pump in cold climates. So how do heat pumps perform in Alaska? We did a study in 2014-2015 uh, where we looked at multiple heat pumps in Alaska uh, in multiple communities. Uh, the communities are here on this map. And the ones with the orange square, so that's Dillingham, Juneau, and Wrangell, is where we evaluated the, the heat pumps in much greater detail than in the other communities. And I'm going to share with you the results of what we found out um, regarding uh, those uh, those three heat pumps, uh, where we did a detailed monitoring. So uh, on the y-axis, that's the coefficient of performance. And on the x-axis, that's the outdoor temperature. And with the coefficient of performance, I should point out that we studied not only the steady state coefficient of performance, but we study the integrated coefficient of performance also. And I'll explain the difference between those two on, on this series that has, that has the blue dots and, and the black dots. So this is an air to water heat pump uh, in Juneau, Alaska. And uh, so the, the black dots represent the integrated coefficient of performance and the blue dots represent the steady state coefficient of performance. And as you can see in the range of the outside temperatures from say 40 degrees Fahrenheit to you know, maybe 45 degrees Fahrenheit or, or so, uh, the black dots are on top of the blue dots. So that means the integrated coefficient of performance is the same as the steady state coefficient of performance. And it is that because in this temperature range, uh, the heat pump does operate in steady state. It means just continuously running without any cycling. That's what it means. Um, but then what happens when the temperatures are warmer outside and you know, above 45 or so degrees Fahrenheit, now the heat demand of the building is too low and the heat pump, even in the lowest compressor speed, uh, provides too much heat. And so the only way that the heat pump can deal with the with the low heat load is that it needs to cycle. You know, it turns on and then it turns off, then it turns on and it turns off. So that's why the integrated coefficient of performance is lower than the steady state coefficient of performance. So the integrated coefficient of performance, that's what represents the true efficiency of the of the heat pump as it's running in those conditions. Now, what happens in the colder temperatures, you know, below say 40 degrees Fahrenheit or so? Well, remember the, the outside coil needs to be cooler than the outside environment. That's how it's sucking the heat uh, from the outside air. And when the coil is below freezing, uh, there can be condensation. And when it's below freezing, it means it means it's it's forming ice. And and so as the as the outside coil is is icing up, it's uh, decreasing you know, the efficiency of the heat pump because it's basically insulating the outside coil. And the heat pump ever so often needs to go through what we call a defrost uh, to clean that outside coil. And the way the heat pump is doing, uh, it, it reverses its operation and it takes a little bit of heat from the building and sends it to the outside coil to make the coil hot, uh, you know, way above the freezing point, and it simply melts melts the frost that's on the on the outside coil. So because of this, now the heat pump, because of the defrost, uh, the heat pump is cycling, and because of those cycles, again, the integrated coefficient of performance as the black series is lower than the steady state coefficient of performance. 
one thing I want to mention about about this uh, red and green series. This was a ductless mini split heat pump in Wrangell, Alaska. Uh, is that uh, for one, as you can see, it it you know, operated uh, with a very high coefficient of performance. But for two, we we noticed, and it wasn't the purpose of this research, but uh, we noticed that with lower levels of thermal loading. Uh, the coefficient of performance went up, and and what I mean by lower levels of thermal loading, you know, just uh, think of, for example, of oversized systems, you know, that are that are too big for a given application, which means they operate only on a partial load. So so we noticed that this heat pump, when operating um, on a partial load, uh, was operating with a with a higher coefficient of performance, and the lower, at least in the range where we measured it, the lower the thermal load, uh, the higher was the coefficient of performance. But unfortunately, we can't you know, just make the conclusion that we should be oversizing the heat pumps to increase the efficiency, because uh, with this heat pump, you know, this, uh, this purple and blue series, it was also a ductless municipal heat pump. This one was in Dillingham, Alaska. We noticed the opposite. We, know, we noticed that with lower levels of thermal loading, uh, the coefficient of performance went down. So, so this triggered an important research question, which we actually um, uh, address later, and, and we are still in the process of addressing it uh, to get more details about it, and I'll talk about it in just uh, just a little bit. Uh, so while I am on this graph, I'm gonna go back to back to what I was saying that you know, say in rural Alaska, we want the coefficient of performance to be at least two and a half uh, for it to be making sense. Um, and so when you look at this graph, you know, we talk about, you know, appropriate situations versus situations that are not appropriate. So, uh, for example, this heat pump here, uh, you know, the ductless municipal heat pump in Wrangell, Alaska, in this specific situation, that's an appropriate situation to use a heat pump. You can see, you know, it operates, you know, um, with a very high coefficient of performance, especially in these conditions um, that, are, that are right here. Uh, now, this heat pump in Dillingham, Alaska, in these conditions, when we talk about, you know, minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit or so, it's not really an appropriate situation to operate a heat pump. You see that the coefficient of performance is, is close to one, and, you know, like we explained, we want the coefficient of performance to be at least two and a half uh, for it to be making sense as far as, as far as saving diesel. So, you know, when the coefficient, when the coefficient of performance here is, is close to one, you know, this, this heat pump in these conditions is, is wasting diesel. You know, the diesel that needs to uh, be burnt in the power plant to produce the electricity for the heat pump is a greater amount than, you know, if this building were just heated, heated with, with diesel used used on site uh, but uh so when i when i mentioned you know the number of cop of two and a half it what the threshold really is it depends on the specific location uh in fairbanks for example kind of that that break even point is a cop of about two when we when we look at the greenhouse gas emissions uh the the threshold is about cop of two and you know some of you might think well you know some of the electricity comes from coal in, in Fairbanks. So does this really make sense to use a heat pump? But the reality of that is that the coal-fired power plants are mostly maxed out already. And so when you when you install a heat pump, uh, what you are increasing is not uh, the output from the coal-fired power plants. You are increasing the output from other power plants uh, that use other fuels. You know, Mainly, it's actually the combined cycle power plant in North Pole, which is very efficient, and and that's why that's why uh, the uh, the greenhouse gas emissions uh, from the extra electricity produced are, are not that high, and and that's why the break-even point in Fairbanks is is roughly two uh, when it comes to the uh, to the environmental impacts. From the economic perspective, um, it's a little bit different. Uh, they used to be pretty well aligned in, in Fairbanks, Alaska. That when you look at the break-even point, it was also the COP of O2. Uh, recently, the prices of electricity increased in Fairbanks, so now we are looking at COP of about two and a half. Uh, so you need a COP of uh, at least about two and a half uh, to start saving money with using a heat pump. I should point out that, uh, again, this study was done in 2014-2015. Uh, uh, the efficiency of heat pumps has, uh, has improved since. 
Um, so, uh, so nowadays, you know, you can get heat pumps that operate with COP greater than two uh, at zero degrees Fahrenheit. So, uh, so this, you know, this uh, this picture is changing. So, uh, what are the appropriate situations uh, for using heat pumps is is changing. So again, nowadays, even at like zero degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, in Fairbanks, uh, it's possible to operate a heat pump if, if operated correctly uh, in a beneficial way that's saving greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, so moving on. So here are some general conclusions from the detailed monitoring. So, so one of the things you could see that uh, you know those cycles significantly decrease the performance. So, so optimizing the defrost controls controls for cold common operation um, can significantly increase the performance. That's actually one of the research projects we are working on right now to optimize the algorithm uh, for the defrost. And the other thing you can see that there is a large variation efficiency among individual models. So when you are selecting you know, a heat pump for your specific situation, uh, it's important to pay the pay attention uh, to the model you are purchasing. Uh, because uh, there can be a, a big difference in the efficiency. And this graph just shows the cycles due to defrost. So uh, here, the green series is the thermal output of a heat pump. And, and as you can see, the thermal output at some point starts decreasing. And it's because there's ice uh, building up on the outside coil. And then the heat pump goes through a defrost. So it means it totally turns off uh, the indoor unit, so there is no thermal output. Uh, the compressor is is running, uh, but uh, so it's using energy, but it's not providing any heat. Simply, the energy just goes in the compressor, so the compressor can actually take some heat from the building to send it to the outside coil to 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 warm it up. And when it's done defrosting the coil, the heat pump starts running again. And as you can see, you know, so there's the green series uh, has a certain thermal output, but then as the ice is building up, the output goes down again, and then it goes into another defrost. So this is uh, just to show you why the, the defrost are decreasing the overall performance of the heat pump. And here's an example of a graph from the cycling in the low load conditions. So now if uh, if it's warm outside and the thermal load of the building is low, uh, the heat pump, even when it's uh, at its lowest compressor speed, uh, is providing too much heat. And the only way it can handle the low thermal load is through cycling. So here's an example of that. Here again, the green series is the thermal output. As you can see, you know the heat pump is on for about five minutes, then off for about five minutes then on for about five minutes and off for about five minutes. And it's short cycling um, like this in these, uh, in these um, cycles to accommodate the low thermal load. So besides the detailed monitoring of those uh, three heat pumps that we talked about, we did a general monitoring of 30 heat pumps in Alaska. And it was a mix of uh, ductless heat pumps, uh, ducted heat pumps, and air to water systems. And it was a mix of commercial and residential installations, and some were retrofit appliances, and some were new installations. What we mean by retrofit appliances is in existing buildings where they already had a different heat source installed, and they installed a heat pump to it unlike new installations, uh, which would be a new building that's already being planned uh, with the heat pump as its primary source. So what we found out, uh, 29 out of those 30 systems provided adequate or expected heat. There were two repairs needed, but both fixed at no cost to the, to the building owner. 11 people performed maintenance, uh, mostly simple things, uh, things like cleaning the filters of the unit. And 12 people used their backup heating system, although 29 people had backup uh, heat available. So, so the, the summary message from all this is that people are pretty happy with heat pumps. And, and that's why there is an in increasing interest in heat pumps in Alaska. So I mentioned before that we we noticed, you know, in that field study, we noticed that uh, the coefficient of performance is changing 
with different levels of thermal loading. And that triggered the research project that we that we completed last year. And in the in that research project, we are focused on this exact question: how does the coefficient of performance change with different levels of, of thermal loading? And this was a study in the lab. So we completed a study in the lab, even though we have more studies to do uh, that relate to, to the field performance. And so in this lab study, we, we measured four heat pumps in a in a cold chamber. And, and studied how the coefficient of performance changes with different levels of thermal loading. Uh, we also did it at, at different temperatures. And uh, here's one of the graphs that came from that study. Uh, this is a graph that's combined for all four, all four heat pumps. And on the y-axis, that's the coefficient of performance. On the x-axis, uh, that's the thermal load, that's percentage of the maximum thermal load. And so what you can see uh, is that uh, when the heat pump is running at its maximum capacity, it's operating with a certain coefficient of performance. And then when you start decreasing the thermal load, the coefficient of performance is going up. But it doesn't just continue going up uh, like you know some people would expect. At some, some point, it maxes out. And then when you're further decreasing the thermal load, it starts going down. And, and so, so this makes sizing heat pumps kind of complicated because we cannot just say, yeah, uh, you know, we should have undersized systems. Um, you know, undersized systems are going to be running at its maximum maximum capacity, which means that they're relatively low thermal load. Or we can just say, you know, we can have way oversized system because if we are way oversized systems, they are going to be running at at uh, you know very very low thermal load uh, compared to the maximum capacity. And again, they are going to operate. Uh, with low coefficient of performance. So from here, you can see we want to size the heat pumps just right. Uh, but uh, how to size them just right is not an, an, a question that's completely answered. So this data again is based from uh, based of a, a lab study looking at the, uh, the steady state coefficient of performance. But what we need to really answer this question, we would need the integrated coefficient of performance, uh, you know, from from real. Uh, uh, field performance of, of, of a heat pump or multiple heat pumps, uh, which is what we don't have yet. We are working on that, but but we don't have that yet. Uh, but, uh, you know, so we don't have conclusions from this study. It just helped us determine directions for, for future research. But one of the things that came from this also is the COP, uh, COP map here on the x-axis. Uh, that's the outside temperature. On the y-axis, that's the coefficient of performance. This is again combined for those four heat pumps that we that we studied. And you can see two series here. So the blue dots, that's the coefficient of performance for maximum thermal loading. So that would mean operation you know, in this part of this graph, a maximum thermal loading. And, and the orange dots, it's the coefficient of performance at thermal loading that's close to maximum efficiency, which means somewhere here close to the peak. Uh, so that's why that's why the two series here, and um, this is the steady state coefficient of performance. So we can't really use these numbers directly uh, to estimate field performance because you know the field it's going to cycle uh, due to due to defrost. But you can only see you know I mentioned that it's realistic at you know zero degrees Fahrenheit. Um, if you operate the heat pump correctly, have an efficient model, uh, it's possible to achieve a coefficient of performance you know, greater than two, and and you can you can kind of see it see it from this graph. You know, zero degrees Fahrenheit would be would be somewhere here, and and COP of two would be somewhere here. Uh, so assuming we uh, we we also control it well to to minimize the cycling due to defrost, it is possible to operate it with a COP uh, greater greater than two. Um, so I'm going to move on here. Here are some heat pump resources for you. Uh, Alaska Heat Smart website is a great resource. They are located in Juneau, but they have resources that are applicable uh, to Alaska as a whole. Uh, then, of course, the Cold Climate Housing Research Center uh, has resources about heat pumps. Uh, then this Alaska Municipal Heat Pump Calculator is something we are gonna play with uh, after I'm done with this presentation. So we'll use it to, and I'll demonstrate how to use it. Uh, so you can evaluate in your specific situation uh, if a heat pump makes sense for you. Then there's also this fairly new tool. So this was made uh, last year. 
that actually utilizes uh, the Alaska municipal heat pump calculator, uh, but it uh, it compiles the results into things like maps and gives you a good visual idea of things like where heat pumps are cost effective and where they are not in Alaska. Then there are national and international resources, uh, the Northeast Energy Efficiency uh, Partnerships uh, Cold Climate Air Society Pump List is a, is a great resource. And, and also here's this toolkit from, from Canada. If you're interested in more detailed classes uh, beyond this one you are just taking, um, there, are, there are resources available for you. Uh, Katra and Osan, um, here's their website, and Wisdom Associates, uh, here's their website. There's also this database for incentives, uh, not just for energy efficiency, but also for renewable energy. Uh, this is a national database, but it's also a good resource. So when we talk about heat pumps to save energy, we shouldn't forget about other things we can do to save energy because obviously the biggest savings can be achieved with a system approach where we combine the heat pump with other energy efficiency measures. And just to demonstrate what kind of savings are achieved, here's an example. It's a, it's a house in Dillingham, Alaska. It's heated with an air source heat pump. You can see the outdoor unit here, but it also has an extremely energy efficient building envelope. It has about 28 inches thick walls. It's extremely airtight. And, and the result of all that is that uh, the heating bill, uh, the heating bill for for this home in Dillingham, Alaska, is uh, a few hundred dollars annually, which is a small fraction of the heating bills of conventional buildings in Dillingham, Alaska, which typically pay a, a few thousand dollars annually. So this is just to demonstrate what kind of savings uh, can be achieved when you combine a heat pump with other energy efficiency measures. So how do you know if heat pump is the best next step for you or if there are you know, maybe most more cost-effective things that you can do first to, to your home? So one of the best ways to find out is to get an energy audit. And the way it works is that uh, you invite an energy auditor to your house and, and they come and they look in the attic and if you have an attic, uh, you know, in the crawl space, and, they they take some some measurements and they do some testing. You know, one of the main tests they do they do a blower door test to to test how how airtight your home is. And and then the at the end they process all the data and and they they come up with a report. And the report has a lot of valuable information in it. One of the things that it has in it is a list of potential improvement options. And not just a list of potential improvement options, but also uh, it gives you a sense of the payback, and and it you know, it, it sorts it in a way that the, the most cost effective things are shown first on the list. So this is a great guide for you to use to decide what will be the you know most cost effective most cost effective cost effective things to do to your to your home first. And yeah, that's how you can decide if you if it's time for to install a heat pump or if there are other things and that would be better to focus on first. So there are various uh, financing options and incentives uh, for heat pumps. Um, on the Alaska Heat Smart website, uh, I showed the link on one of the previous uh, sites, uh, has a good information about uh, uh, the financing and incentives uh, that's currently existing, and also about uh, the uh, incentives that are coming. So uh, there is a lot of funding uh, coming uh, through the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, some of which is for is for heat pumps, um, and uh, so it's not it's not here quite yet, uh, but. Uh, but it, it is coming. Uh, the Alaska Heat Smart website, uh, besides uh, information about other incentives, has also information on this funding that is coming through the Infl In Inflation Reduction Act. So I see there are some there are some questions. One of them says, uh, uh, "Can a heat pump be integrated with hydronic heating?" That's a that's a great question. Yeah, thank you, thank you for that. So um, with with hydronic heating, uh, the market for air-to-water heat pumps in the United States is very small. 
so most of the interest has been in the in the air to air heat pump. Uh, uh, that's not to say that there are none, uh, but but uh, it's a small market for the air to water heat pump. Uh, but it can be it can be purchased. Uh, you can purchase an air to water heat pump and and integrate it with your hydronic heat, uh, heating. The the challenge there in Alaska particularly is that most of the heating systems, most of the hydronic heating systems, uh, have been designed for a relatively high temperature of the delivery fluid. You know, especially when it's building uh, buildings with like baseboard heaters. And and now, if you want to just use the heat pump, but not have to do any upgrades to, to other components or heating system, the heat pump will need to achieve a, you know this very high temperature of of the of the distribution fluid. And uh, with this very high temperature, for one, you are really reducing the coefficient of performance of the heat pump, and for two, in some situations, it's actually beyond the limits of of the models available on the market. So, uh, so the the answer is yes, it can be done, uh, but there are challenges to it. If it's in a new installation where you can, you know, new new home where you can plan on it already, um, especially if you are planning like floor heating, uh, and you know, design in a way and that uh, that it's for a low, relatively low temperatures of the delivery fluid, then then uh, it's a much better option for utilizing a heat pump uh, for that. Uh, but with that, I should also also point out that uh, a possible combination, if you only have uh, a boiler, uh, you know, a, a hydronic heating distribution, uh, and want a heat pump in your house, also, uh, they they work or can work fairly well uh, in combination with the air to air heat pumps, you know, especially the uh, the ductless um, mini split heat pumps, uh, or sometimes uh, multi split heat pumps if you have multiple uh, indoor units. So that way, the heat pump is not relying on uh, the distribution system that you have, you know, and the uh, and the, the emitters, you know, like the uh, like the baseboard heats that you have installed, uh, but can can reduce the load uh, for the hydronic system or completely take over in some conditions. Okay, continuing on with the questions here. Uh, could you put the info sources in the chat so we can copy for future roses? Uh, and Roselle did that. Thank you so much for doing that. Another question. Are you aware of any DC powered heat pumps and that can be run with solar PV without the inverter losses? So, there are some heat pumps on the market uh, that are already designed to operate with with photovoltaics, uh, and they can operate without uh, being connected to the grid. I do not know that they would be all just DC, um, or since they are often meant to integrate with the grid too, as just one of the option for the product. Uh, so they do. They do uh, have uh, uh, to have the AC AC components in it. Uh, I I'm not sure if they will be tying uh, the PV or uh, the photovoltaics, which the output is DC. So I don't know if they will be tying it uh, uh, directly to the DC components of the heat pumps, or if, if they would just do it uh, you know on the very front end, uh, which means they would uh, they would be going from the photovoltaic DC to AC and then feeding it to the heat pump. So I, I do not know uh, the specifics of that, but as far as uh, heat pumps connected to photovoltaic, photovoltaics, yes, there are some products on the market that are meant for that purpose. All right, uh, so that's all questions I can see for now, but feel free to post other questions as they are coming up. And in the meantime, I'm going to continue going here with the presentation. So uh, what are the main conclusions from all this? So as we could see, uh, air source heat pumps can significantly reduce energy use and energy costs when used in appropriate situations and, and used in an appropriate way. So, so we showed um, uh, some examples of what are appropriate situations and, and, and what are not. 
uh, but there are you know there's things we know and there are things we don't know yet. So so there is there is more research needed to to gain better understanding of those things we don't we don't know yet to be able to inform uh, decisions about how to operate uh, heat pumps in cold climates and and uh, what heat pumps to be installing in cold climates. So one of the things we don't quite understand yet is how the true field performance is is changing with different levels of thermal loading. In other words, you know how should we be sizing heat pumps in very cold climates? Uh, that's one of the things uh, we don't quite understand yet, but it's one of the things that we are currently studying. And the last conclusion here, obviously, a system approach yields biggest savings when you combine the heat pump uh, with other energy efficiency measures. Lots of people and entities help uh, with these projects that I just talked about. So big thank yous. We couldn't have done it without them. And like I, I promised, uh, so now that we are done with the, with the presentation, um, I'm going to demonstrate two online tools here. So one is the Alaska Municipal Heat Pump Calculator that will allow you to evaluate uh, how a heat pump would perform in your specific situation. And the other one uh, is the Heat Pumps Alaska Visualization Tool uh, made by the University of Washington uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, entities elsewhere, including entities in Alaska. Uh, and I'm hoping we can look at, uh, look at it together also. So I see there is another question uh, in the chat. Is there a way to know that an installer is properly educated to be able to install a heat pump for my specific situation? So um, the Alaska Heat Smart actually has some uh, some resources for that. Um, I'm not sure if they are current on their website, uh, but they are they are really approachable. You know, Alaska Heat Smart it's a great entity. I'm so glad we have them in Alaska. So uh, it might be worthwhile to give them, giving them a call and and seeing uh, seeing uh, what uh, if they don't have like an official checklist published yet, they might be able to give you insights on on that. Uh, so, uh, but you know, obviously you will be looking at you know things like are they licensed, how many installs have they done. Uh, you'll be you'll be looking at the quotes uh, from the installer. Uh, it would be great to actually talk to somebody who had the heat pumps installed installed from them. Um, but again, uh, the Alaska Heat Smart actually has been dealing with this question, so I'm going to refer you to them. So another question: Do you know of any CO2 refrigerant-based air-to-water heat pumps available on the market, or cascading heat pumps that achieve higher cold climate COPs using multiple working fluids so it's almost two separate questions there yeah thanks for the question so there are there are co2 heat pumps on the market so talking about refrigerant here so refrigerant uh, and types of refrigerant is, is a huge topic because the the refrigerants currently used uh, most of them have a high what we call global warming potential so despite the fact that the heat pump itself uh, you know when you operate efficiently is saving um, fossil fuels and greenhouse gases uh, the refrigerant itself when it leaks and and it and it and it does does leak because uh, Nothing is perfect, especially you know the field fabricated connections. When the heat pump is being installed, there are uh, there are often some leaks of the refrigerant. Uh, the refrigerant itself is a very potent greenhouse gas. So so there are efforts to to replace the conventional refrigerants uh, with uh, natural refrigerants or or other refrigerants that have a globe a low global warming potential. And CO two is one of them that's that's being researched. And so yes, there are some heat pumps on the market that use CO2 as a refrigerant and that are air to water uh, heat pumps. Now, uh, as far as uh, achieving higher COP, that's not to say that by using CO2, you are going to achieve a higher COP, uh, but you are going to use a refrigerant that has a lower, lower global warming uh, potential. Uh, as far as cascading, uh, cas cascading heat pumps, 
uh, you know, using using kind of two stages um, for the heat pumps, it's not also you know necessarily gonna in increase the coefficient of performance, but it's a possibility to achieve higher delivery temperatures, uh, which uh, might be needed in some applications. All right, I don't see any other questions right now. So let's look at the first tool. So Alaska mini split heat pump calculator. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here with the presentation and I'm gonna share a screen with the heat pump calculator. So give me a few moments here. And I see in the meantime, more questions popped up. Uh, so one is, does it make sense to put a heat pump on the south side, warmer side of the house? That's a that's a great question. We're actually kind of trying to get more more data on that. Uh, there's some there's some anecdotal data on that. Uh, the the I think the you know the summary message from that is wind is going to be a lot more important than the sun. So um, you know you um, you don't you don't want it uh, somewhere where uh, you know in in the worst case scenario of course you know the wind could be actually reversing the spinning uh, of your fan uh, so uh, you wouldn't want that uh, to be happening the heat pump wouldn't uh, wouldn't work well in those conditions but but uh, so it'll be on the windward side and now on the leeward side it's 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 you know more perfect from the wind but that's where you get a snow drift. Uh, that's not to say you cannot install a heat pump there, but you do need to know how high your snow drifts go and install above those snow drifts. So some of the installations are actually very high uh, on on the wall for for that for that purpose. Now with the sun, uh, the I'm suspecting, and again we don't we don't have uh, any strong data on this, but I'm suspecting that that for the efficiency of heat pump, heat pump itself. It's not gonna make a big difference because uh, the the sun is not gonna be shining directly on the heat exchanger. You know the heat exchanger is is uh, you know facing towards towards the building, uh, and the air temperature is is pretty much the same regardless of which side of the house you are on. Where I'm hearing it does make some difference is when uh, say the fan of the heat pump starts building some ice on that. And disbalances, and then you know, starting to make weird noises, and weird noises, and there's a bigger wear and tear, and and that's when the sun shining actually on that unit can help melt some of the ice on on those fans. Uh, again, this is just some anecdotal information, uh, something we would like to get more data on. If any of you has data on this, please you know contact us. We would we would love to hear. The next question, does it make sense to put a heat pump? Um, okay, uh, we just answered that question. Okay. Uh, uh, then there's one last question, like if you put it in a solarium. So with the with the solarium, uh, it it would it would be difficult to you know and and you would really need to. Uh, need to run the numbers for that. But what the heat pump does, it's extracting the heat from the environment around that. So what could very well happen in the solarium that, yeah, once you turn on the heat pump, it's warm in there and, and you, are, you are taking the heat from the warm air and the heat pump is operating efficiently, but as it's sucking the heat from there, it's cooling it down. And, and because the solarium is enclosed, uh, you might come to a point where the temperature in the solarium is gonna be less than in the outside air. And then you are better off just having the heat pump directly in the outside air than in the solarium. So I would imagine that you know with a very big solarium um, and your know, careful design, um, uh, it would be possible to achieve what you are asking about. Uh, but I'm suspecting it would not be a practical solution, you know, when it comes to the size of the solarium. But I haven't I haven't run the numbers, uh, but. Uh, this is uh, this is just the things you would want to look at if you were designing a system like that. Okay, let's go to the heat pump calculator. So let me share my screen. All 
Okay, so the Alaska mini split heat pump calculator. Uh, I'm gonna so copy paste copy paste the link into the chat so everybody has that readily available if you want to play with it in the future. So it was created by uh, Alan Mitchell uh, of Analysis North. And uh, like I said, there are a lot of things we know about heat pumps and there are some things we don't know yet. And, and so uh, Alan did a pretty amazing job taking the things that we do know and compiling it into this calculator to give you basically the best estimate uh, for the performance of a heat pump based on the data and based on the things that we know about heat pumps in Alaska today. And, and so um, uh, it's a great tool um, to evaluate again, uh, how a heat pump is going to perform in your specific situation. You know, estimate it based on what we know. It's, it's just an estimate, but again, kind of the best thing you can get today. So uh, I'm going to run through this calculator and then I'll come back to uh, some of those questions uh, that are popping up that are not directly related to, to, this, to this calculator. Uh, so let's, let's play with this together. So um, I'm going to mostly use the default values here just, just for, the, for the sake of time. Uh, but there are some things we do need to fill out here. The, the first thing to fill out here is the location. So, so you guys, you guys tell me uh, which which town in Alaska would you like to do this for? So again, we are gonna you know use this tool to evaluate how a heat pump performs in a given location. So I see Fairbanks in the chat. Uh, okay, let's do let's do Fairbanks. So let's go to Fairbanks, Alaska. Now you have the option to select the utility rate schedule, or you can manually enter uh, the the electricity prices. I'm gonna start with the utility rate schedule, but uh, then I'll I'll have a uh, I'll have a comment on that. So because of it's Fairbanks, so um, I'm gonna use so you know Golden Valley Electric Association residential rates, and this is gonna load uh, for one uh, the electricity rates. Um, uh, you know, the price for electricity, but also part of the reason I'm doing this, it's going to load what the average fuel mix is for the power plants in, in Fairbanks, Alaska. Uh, but then uh, what what just happened, and uh, you know, it happened recently, that's why this tool is pretty current, uh, but it doesn't have the latest changes in it. Uh, there was a significant increase in, in electricity prices uh, uh, at uh, GVA, Golden Valley Electric Association. So recently it actually went to 30 cents per kilowatt hour and it's not reflected here yet. So uh, for those situations, um, and, and again, typically this is pretty current. This is kind of a unique situation that the rates just changed um, in, in uh, uh, Fairbanks or other communities uh, served by uh, GVA. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna override that. I'm gonna use manual entry here. And, and currently it is about 30 cents per kilowatt hour. And the customer charge is still $22.50 per month. But again, if you, you know, don't know in your community what the current trade is, just going with the default in most situations here gives you a reasonable estimate. Uh, you know, the Fairbank situation is, is kind of an exception right now. So like I said, I'm going to go most with the default residential building. Size of the building, uh, you guys choose. So how big a building are we going to do this simulation for? How many square feet? 1,500 square feet, 2,000 square feet. All right, so let's do an average. 1,750 square feet. I'm gonna go with the defaults here for the sake of time. Sorry, I just uh, click at the wrong place. No garage, uh, two by six construction, select existing space heating fuel type. In Fairbanks, it's likely gonna be heating all number one. <clears throat> I'm gonna go with the defaults uh, so it's not used for anything else. Uh, um, $453 per gallon. I think it's pretty reasonable. Again, it might not be the most current, but I think it's pretty close. I'm gonna go with that. 
uh, 80% efficient system, uh, a hydronic system. Now, if you do know how many gallons a year you are using for your building, uh, you are going to put it here and it will calibrate the model a little bit better. If you don't know it, it's okay because uh, the model estimates it from the data that we just entered. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it blank because we don't have a specific building here. This electricity usage, different parts of the year would matter where uh, you have different prices for different amounts you use, like, you know, like for example, communities that get power cost equalization. In Fairbanks, it doesn't matter. It's the same price regardless of what you use. So, so um, we can ignore this. Heating temperature set point, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm going to leave it as is. We are going to consider a single zone heat pump as opposed to multi zone. We are going to go with a simpler method. Uh, there's also an advanced method where you can select a specific model. But let's just go with a simpler one. And, and the simpler one used here simply assumes a, a heat pump uh, that has uh, HSPF. So that's the heating seasonal performance factor, HSPF heating seasonal performance factor of 14, which by the way, is one of the main things you want to be looking at when you are buying a heat pump. So uh, so the HSPF is, uh, uh, is, is a rating uh, uh, created by an established test procedure. Uh, so that way you can compare a model to model. And uh, so HSPF of 14, it's actually one of the most efficient on the market. So keep in mind the simulation we are gonna do here is for one of the most efficient models on the market. Uh, while talking about the heating seasonal performance factor, I should also point out that the test procedure recently changed. And so now the situation is a little more complicated because what exists uh, for heat pumps is the HSPF and HSPF2. The HSPF2 is the new heating seasonal performance factor done using the new test procedure. Uh, and so the reason I'm mentioning it is that if you are comparing you know, different units and trying to decide which one you are gonna buy, and if you are comparing them based on the heating seasonal performance factor, you wanna make sure you are looking at, you are looking at the same HSPF. You can compare them either you know, based on the HSPF itself or based on the HSPF2. You just don't want to be mixing those two up because they were they were uh, determined using different test procedures. Uh, so that's just a, just a side note there. OK, installed install cost. I'm going to go with the default here. No rebates, no financing. Uh, heat pump is turned off below five degrees Fahrenheit. So as you know, by now, it doesn't make much sense to operate a heat pump when it's very cold. So you'll be probably turning it off at a certain point. And here you can you can put in at what point you'll be turning it off. So the default is you'll be turning it off when the outside temperature is less than five degrees Fahrenheit because you're assuming that below those temperatures is going to be inefficient to operate the, the heat pump. And it's just going to be uh, wasting you money and, and potentially also, you know, uh, wasting fuel and producing more greenhouse gases. So I'm going to go with the default of five degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, is all the buildings heat currently provided by one uh, space heater, like a Toyo stove? I'm going to go with the default uh, no, which means the heat pump doesn't serve the whole building, but you can here set how much of a building it is serving. I'm going to go with the default of 46%, uh, but also with the default that bedrooms can be as much as five degrees cooler than main space, it means some of the heat that's delivered from the heat pump in the main space then actually makes it into the bedrooms also uh, because they are maintained cooler. And especially when you keep the doors open there. There is no sales tax in Fairbanks and we entered all that was needed. And so let's calculate the results. Okay, so the rate of return is 1.2%, which is pretty close to zero. So, so there is not much much return on on the heat pump right now. The net present value is actually negative. So, 
the amount of money that you are going to save over its its life and and this this assume you know a certain discount rate in the analysis which means which means it you know it takes into the account the fact uh that that uh you know money you have today uh, uh or money you save today has a different value than money that you save in the future uh so and the discount rate from this i see is greater than 1.2 percent uh that's why we ended up ending up with a negative number here but positive number here uh, but what it says here we are basically right on the threshold of of making making this this cost effective um and this is largely because of the recent increase in uh, the Golden Valley Electric Association's uh, prices of electricity. So um, heat pumps, you know, until just recently, you know, we were showing based on numbers, was a good investment in, in Fairbanks, Alaska. Uh, currently, it's swinging a little bit the other way. Uh, so um, I don't know what the future is going to bring, but that's what that's what it that's what it currently is. Uh, so that's what you see on the results. You know, it doesn't necessarily pay back uh, that great. Now, if you have the money just sitting in an account with zero interest rate, then yes, you'll get a little bit of savings. You'll get a return of 1.2%. But if you are you know, investing it somewhere, uh, you will, uh, based on uh, the assumed you know, discount rate in this analysis, uh, you'll be better off with those investments when it comes to you know, the economic perspective. Now, economics is not the only thing, but if that's what you are looking at, this gives you the data for that. You are going to be saving oil, uh, 303 gallons annually, uh, but of course you're going to be using more electricity because that's what the heat pump needs and that's what the economic analysis is based on. Uh, the uh, uh, season average uh, COP is about, is about two and a half, which kind of like I mentioned before, we are right on the margin here of, um, of making this cost effective. And and here it does say it's gonna save a negative amount of CO2 emissions, but this is based on the average fuel mix of uh, the Golden Valley Electric Associations, which doesn't actually uh, fully reflect what's gonna happen uh, when you when you use a heat pump. So like like I mentioned. Uh, the coal-fired power plants are pretty much maxed out. So by installing heat pump, you are not going to be increasing the consumption of coal. It's going to be other sources that are going to pick it up. Uh, my understanding is it's mostly the combined cycle plant in North Pole, which is very efficient. And we have done the analysis with that. And in this analysis, uh, we know that you are saving greenhouse gas emissions uh, in a situation like this. So, so this number actually doesn't fully reflect uh, what's what's actually happening. Uh, so what is what is happening currently is that yes, you are saving greenhouse gas emissions, but you are not necessarily making financial profit um, in this specific situation that we modeled here. It doesn't mean we should forget about heat pumps. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll come I'll come back to this later. Uh, but um, I'm, I want to cover the rest of the uh, the data here. So results. Uh, by month, uh, so as you can see uh, here, you know the red parts are what's covered by the existing heating system. Uh, the blue parts is what's covered by heat pump. And obviously, in the very cold months, uh, there is not uh, much heat supply from the heat pump. It's mostly in the warmer months when the heat pump is supplied by the heat pump. So this is looking at the the cost of a month uh, for your energy. And here you can actually see that every single month you are saving money thanks to the heat pump. If you are losing money, it would have uh, red parts in it. There are no red parts in it. So uh, so there are you know the savings, uh, you know, like like in, in April, for example. Uh, the you know the black dot is what you were originally paying for heating that month. And and now uh, now that you install a heat pump, uh, you know the the green is what the heat pump is saving you, which means you are only paying you know this much. The blue bar represents how much uh, you are you are paying now. So the good news is that every month you are saving money. The reason that the net present value was negative is not because you are paying now more for energy. It's because of the initial cost of the heat pump. So, which then, uh, based on uh, the the life of the heat pump, which I think is assumed that 14 years in this software, uh, still doesn't completely pay back for that. 
so that's the that's the main information you get from this simulation but like i said you know the fact that uh if you are just purely looking at saving money uh, and if you are looking at you know saving greenhouse gas emissions this is still a good installation but if you are purely looking at saving money uh the fact that it's negative doesn't mean that you know you should give up on heat pumps uh currently uh they don't quite make any economic sense in this specific situation you i would still encourage you to run this calculator for your specific situation because it might make sense in yours uh but but even if not uh you know heat pumps for one are getting more efficient and for two we have the rebates coming through the uh inflation reduction act so you know, st stay tuned for that, and don't don't give up on heat pumps. Stay tuned for that, and we can we can then simulate it here. So we can go back and say, okay, you know, it doesn't quite pencil out, but what if now, you know, so here is the assumed install cost, but what if now we get a rebate? Let's say I'm gonna put in, uh, you know, let's say part of the heat pump gets paid from a rebate, two thousand dollars. I'm making up a number here, um, and and let's rerun the calculations. All of a sudden, you have a very good return on your investment of about 9%, and you are in positive numbers with the net present value. So this is just to show that uh, heat pumps still do have a good potential even in places like Fairbanks. And of course, we have people from other communities here. So, uh, so I'm going to encourage you to run this calculator for your specific communities to see how the heat pump is going to perform in your situation. Okay, so uh, there's a question online. What are manufacturers' recommendations for the outside temperature and when to turn off uh, the unit? Uh, five above seems pretty warm. Uh, thanks for the question. So, so it would not be the manufacturer who would be recommending when to turn it off because the manufacturer makes the unit for all kinds of places. You know, they don't know what place the unit is gonna go into. And you know, um, and a place like place like Fairbanks, you know, uh, might have a very different fuel mix and and very different prices uh, than other places. So you know, when we are looking at the greenhouse gas emissions, that's when we are looking at the fuel mix versus the type of fuel you'll be using for heating. Uh, when we are looking at the economics, we are looking at the cost of electricity versus the cost of fuel for your heating. So it's given by the ratio of, of those two, you know, the, the cost per kilowatt hour uh, versus the cost uh, per unit of your, of your uh, fuel used for heating. And different communities are going to have a different ratio. And that's what's going to determine when it makes sense uh, to use it uh, in those temperatures versus it's not. But you know, a good thing about this calculator is that that you can use it to evaluate, you know, at which temperature should you be turning it off. So so right now, you know, we are we are saving $827 over the life of the heat pump in terms of its present value. So these are not you know uh, the actual dollars, these are you know the value converted to the present value of those dollars. Uh, so let's see what happens if we if we use it down lower. So remember 827 I'm going to change this. And let's say we run it down to zero degrees Fahrenheit. And now we are only saving $736. So this shows us it, you know, in our case, it wouldn't make sense to actually operate it below five degrees Fahrenheit. Should we operate it, you know, only at higher temperatures? You can try that too. So let's say. We actually operate it only down to 10 degrees Fahrenheit. It's 136 again. So five degrees Fahrenheit was pretty optimal here. I'm gonna go back to that. So yes, the heat pump operates more efficiently, right? When you operate it only down to 10 degrees Fahrenheit, but it means you don't get to use it as much. So so then um, you know how much it's gonna be saving you is gonna be less because you don't use it that much. But it uh, seems like the five degrees Fahrenheit was pretty optimal here, actually. <clears throat> OK, next question here. Although the Alaska rebate program doesn't yet exist, the IRS tax credit does, and it is up to $2,000 per year for qualified heat pumps. Uh, uh, don't get back more than 
you own taxes. Uh, is there a place to add that or is that added to rebate? That's a, that's a great point. Thank you. I should have mentioned that. So uh, so while the rebates through the Inflation, Inflation Reduction Act aren't here yet, uh, you might uh, qualify for other incentives. So, so yes, don't, uh, like I said, don't give up on heat pumps, but don't just wait. Actually, that's a good point. Thank you. Look into uh, what current incentives apply uh, to you, uh, like, like, the, like the tax credit. Of course, it depends on, you know, how much you actually pay in taxes, uh, but uh, look into it in your specific situation. And yes, you would enter the tax credit. In this case, you would just, you, you could just uh, include it here. Uh, because it's going to be doing the same thing. So um, that's a great point. Thank you. And the Alaska Heat Smart website uh, has uh, good resources on the incentives currently available, uh, including uh, the current federal tax credit. Okay. Any other questions or comments about the calculator? If there are none, I want to show you one more tool that I promised I would show you. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. No, in fact, I can just go straight to it here. So, so and I'm gonna copy paste the link for you in the chat. Here it goes. So it's an interactive visualization uh, tool regarding heat pumps in Alaska. Uh, so it was uh, created by the University of Washington uh, in collaboration uh, with us and, and other entities. And uh, it, it does multiple things, uh, but uh, for the sake of time, I'll focus on one only. But before I do that, I just want to clarify that it, it works with maps here. And and the maps it works with are maps that are modified for population. So here's a map of Alaska, uh, but here's a map of Alaska modified uh, to reflect population. So you know, Anchorage here is a small dot on the map but it's the biggest population center in Alaska. So that's why Anchorage here on this map is this is this huge area. So that just so we understand uh, the map, uh, why you know, Anchorage is such a huge area. It's uh, in other places, it's to reflect the population. And uh, the tool that uh, I want to show you here is under the borrow potential law and economic feasibility. And what this what this tool does, it actually used Alan Mitchell's calculator that we just used together here, but ran the calculations for various places in Alaska uh, for a typical household and then summarized the results in a map. Now it doesn't have the option actually for the current situation. It has projections here for fuel price increases. I'm just gonna go with the lowest one, three percent increase to be closest to the current situation. And then the map here summarizes the, the results for you. I'm going to make it a little bigger so you can see the whole map in here. And uh, so, and the results now um, are, are color coded. And as you can see here, you know, here's the cost effectiveness in terms of the net present value. And uh, where it's positive is the blue colors. And when it's negative, it's the red colors. And this tool was created last year. So that's why Fairbanks here is slightly blue because it was before the increase in the electricity prices in Fairbanks. Uh, so that's Fairbanks. You know, the, the area right here next to it is the Denali borough. As you can see, it's a little darker. Uh, and and it's it's probably, uh, so it's, you know, the same electricity prices also served uh, by GVA. Uh, but the reason it's a little darker is probably because uh, oil uh, heating oil might be more expensive in Denali borough. And it's a warmer climate, uh, both of which uh, make uh, the heat pumps more cost effective. And then, of course, Southeast Alaska is where uh, there have been the most installations uh, in Alaska because of the relatively cheap electricity uh, from the hydroelectric power plants and because of the relatively warm climate compared to 
uh, other locations in Alaska. So this is a good starting point for you when you are you know, thinking of a heat pump for your place. Um, if you just want to have a quick look uh, to get an idea, do heat pumps make sense at your location? Uh, go to this tool uh, and look. And, and also then you have, you know, here the projections uh, with different subsidies. So, you know, maybe you know that they are eligible for some subsidy. So you will click on it here and, and it's gonna, and it's gonna change your map. Uh, and, uh, and so you would look at your location and get a basic idea uh, if heat pumps make sense uh, for typical households in the location. And if it seems like they are, or, you know, it's close to it, then it's probably worth the time uh, to explore in a greater detail how the heat pump would work for you. And that's when you would go to that calculator that we that we looked at a little while ago to actually and then enter the data for your specific situation and to evaluate how it's gonna work for you. All right. So that's that's the main information I wanted to share here. So any other questions either about this tool or or anything else regarding heat pumps. Okay, uh, I see a question there. I'm surprised that Anchorage is less cost effective than Fairbanks. Can you explain why? That's a that's a great question. Uh, yeah. So um, so Anchorage, uh, as you can see, is is in the red. So um, it's not it's not currently cost effective. Um, if we looked at the greenhouse gas emissions, we, we, by the way, can too, either in that calculator we looked at, or it has this environmental tab here that looks at the greenhouse gas emissions, we would see that, that heat pumps uh, save greenhouse gas in, in Anchorage. It's uh, because they save natural gas. So um, uh, so heat pumps, heat pumps in Anchorage, because of the milder climate than place like Fairbanks, it's actually better to you know, burn that natural gas in a power plant uh, to produce the electricity for the heat pump uh, than it is to just burn natural gas directly at the households in, in, in Anchorage or the buildings in Anchorage. It's because the COP is relatively high thanks to the milder climate. Uh, but the price structures of electricity is such, then economically it, it doesn't pencil out. And, and again, so uh, the main reason for that is you know, relatively low prices of natural gas used for heating versus relatively high prices of electricity, which is what will be needed for the heat pump. So that is that is the reason for that. It might not be, of course, there are a lot of discussions now about uh, you know, supplies of natural gas in Anchorage. So that might not necessarily fully reflect long-term future, uh, but that's where we are currently. All right, any other questions or comments? Seems like there are none. So this is actually great timing because you have five minutes to spare here. And um, there are some things that Rosa still wants to tell you. So I'm gonna stop sharing here and uh, I'm gonna hand it over back to Rosa. So thanks everybody for your attention. Thank you so much, Tom. That was a really wonderful presentation. Um, Everyone, those links are in the chat, but we're also going to be sending out um, the presentation so you can find them there as well if you wanna look at those tools. Um, please answer the poll. Uh, the poll, your feedback just helps us make our future classes better. And speaking of our future classes, we wanna thank GVEA and AHFC for sponsoring this class and our upcoming class next week at the same time, 5.30. It's a class about indoor air quality taught by Patrick Harshorn, who is a longtime home inspector and air quality expert. You can go to cchrc.org slash classes to sign up for that class if you're interested. Thank you so much for attending tonight's presentation. And thank you again, Tom, for a really insightful and relevant presentation, and I hope to see you all next week.